Hello, my name is Dr. Michael O'Kreke. I welcome you to CM Videos, a YouTube channel where we try to get you started with modeling. Today's video is about the abacus modeling of lattice structures. So let's just go ahead and see how this works. All right, so first thing I have to say, this is a viewer requested video. It was requested by Amit, Amit Kuma, and he actually provided me a reference to a paper that I've used to make this possible. So and this is the details of the paper. Again, if you don't have it, go and find it and walk along with me. So what are these lattice structures or what you call lattice cell structures? They're kind of engineered structures having periodic cell made of struts at different orientations. This is a quote from the paper that, um, that Amit provided. And just to explain a little bit more about that. So first you have face sheets in this uh, lattice structures, more like a sandwich structure. And right in the middle, you have this um, lattice arrangement, a lattice cell structure. So there's a combination of that. And there are reasons why these things are used. Essentially, you know, they help with load absorptions, but that's what a lattice cell structure in principle would look like. So what are the applications where these things are used? So this is something I've taken in a paper, which is this reference. If you want, you can go and find out about this. So the interstage structure of a space launch vehicle um, is made from a lattice structure. So basically this component in the middle here is made from uh, a lattice structure. But more interestingly, one of the real interesting uses of lattice uh, structures is in this area of micro lattices. So if you look at the dimensions of this, this is quite small, so about five microns. So you could fit about two or three of that, you know, 50 microns in length, width and height. So they are called micro lattices. They are a new generation of 3D printed structures that have ultra lightweight and enhanced strength. Boeing is actually working on this kind of things, you know, for use in their aerospace fuselage so that if you can use them in aerospace fuselage, then you won't have to burn a lot of fuel. You kind of help the environment more. So this is really an interesting area of research, um, the idea of a lattice um, cell structure. So the advantage is that you can then create any kind of lattice arrangement, depending on the properties that you're interested in, and then you print them. So for example, this is one example, another example, multiple Multiple designs taken from the publication right at the top here, which is a review paper published in 2021. So this is really very interesting and they've given them different names based on the truss arrangement and, and all that. And the aim really is that with all these, you can create different materials with different properties and use them in very interesting ways. And most importantly, they are also lightweight. So they are a massive, massive improvement on uh, traditional composite structures that we currently have. So I will expect in future, this will be the dominant material of design, you know, for major majority of, um, of, of life uh, applications. So, but the challenge in them is that it can be difficult to model these structures. So let's look a little bit more on that. So basically another publication, I picked out this, um, this, this content. Um, and what you find here is this idea of a unit cell. So each lattice structure is made up of a smallest unit, which is a unit cell. And that unit cell could have dimensions that look like this. And they are given different names like you do with crystal plasticity. So for example, this is a simple cubic structure, which is basically a cube with an empty space in the middle. And then you could have a face centered cubic structure where all the main structures are on the faces, a body centered cubic structure where again, everything is meeting on the center, the middle of the body, you know, similar to what you find with crystal plasticity. And then the assembly of the BCC structure looks a bit like that. And just to reflect a bit more, again, the last case, which is a combination of the BCC and the SC design. How do you then want to model with this? So there are different modeling approaches that can be used, but the way I see it is that you could have a structural approach to modeling of these lattices, lattice structures to see how they behave. If you look more closely here, so this is an example of a real sandwich arrangement of that. So if you want to model this, by all means, you can deploy that in a computer, fix the base of this uh, sandwich structure with a lattice arrangement, and then apply a loading, a displacement, a force, whatever you want to apply on the top. And then you're taking everything holistically in this model. You know, it's got its own advantages. So one of the basic advantage of this approach of modeling is that it gives an ideal simulation approach because you're using the full lattice, you're using all the, and you're recreating a, a real result of what the sample should look like when you test them. And that leads to the second pro, which says that results in representative computational data um, that compare very well with experimental data.
So this is what I like about this method. And of course, the third approach, the third pro, is that validating your numerical model with experimental data is quite straightforward because then you could you know, film your experiment and then compare it with this, this kind of numerical simulation. So ideally, this is what you want to do. Um, but there are problems to that, and these are the cons. If you imagine this lattice arrangement, how many you know, unit cells are made up in here, discretizing them, the mesh will be expensive. So it's computationally expensive to do. Meshing of the domain can be quite challenging really can be quite challenging and we'll see that when we start thinking about the meshing of the model today and then multi-scale validation challenges now if we don't want to go the structural route then the other route is the unit cell approach where what you tend to do is you identify a smallest unit cell that represents the repeating unit of the lattice structure so for example in this case we have a unit cell that represents a repeating unit and then it's been highlighted in blue here. So if I extract that, then I can apply similar loading scheme that I have previously on that. But looking at this domain alone, we could find different type of unit cells that define the behavior of the system. And the first category of this, I'm calling this an unconstrained unit cell because it's hanging right in the middle. So as you apply your load here, it's able to move at the top and able to move at the bottom. And so it's kind of floating in space. It's fully unconstrained. So if we're going to build a model around that, then we need to capture the fact that it's kind of this unconstrained unit cell, okay? And this could be a typical boundary condition you would use. You allow it to receive reaction load in the Y direction, which is the direction of the loading top. But then it should be able to freely float around in the other dimensions, um, which is why I've got a ruler support here. So this is one example. Another example for this same domain is where you're looking at what I would call here a lower constrained unit cell. So, and if you look at the system here, so basically because this is connected to the base, it's fixed securely there. So it's con constrained at the base, however, it's free at the very top end here. So when you apply your load, it could roll nicely down, but then it's constrained at the base. So that's a second type of unit cell that you could use for this. And then a third category of that is where you actually take a whole row of unit cell that you know, crisscross this space between the fixed end and the other end. Okay, so someone could use this. This is why unit cells are really interesting. Yeah, they could be this represent unit cell, but when you think of modeling, you're thinking of a representative unit uh, volume element of that unit cell. And so this is another category, which I call a fully constrained unit cell. So we're going to use, you know, we could also explore using this for our simulation. So what are the boundary conditions? Both top and bottom are fully constrained and um, then the body can nicely compress in compression. All right, so what are we going to do here? So this simulation will be based on this unit cell modeling approach as against, as against the structural scale approach. And I will be using the unconstrained body cell centered cubic structure. So basically this is the domain that kind of domain that I'll be using for illustrating what we want to do. Okay, so just a little bit more on that. So basically the full lattice structure of the problem we are trying to deal with will look like this. So I created this in Abacus. Um, now what we are looking for here is isolate a BCC unit cell that is fully unconstrained. And we want to use that for our domain. So to look more specifically at what the dimensions of this domain would be. So I'm looking at an RV of five by five by five. This is the same dimensions that they use in the paper that Amit provided. Um, so these are the dimensions. The strut, which is really what is important here, is the diameter of the strut. So to change the properties, you could change the angle of orientation of the strut or their diameters or even the material they are made from. So, but for the case that we're dealing with here, I'm going to model with a diameter of 0.5 millimeter, a strut angle of 45 degrees, and then the strut length, the total diagonal length of 7.07 millimeter, which is the square root of five squared. So, okay. So these are the things to be in mind. And of course our strut design would be a body centered cubic structure arrangement. So what material are we going to use? Again, taking from the same paper that Amit provided that I'm using for this video. Um, now the material will be made from acry acrylo 
nitrile butadine styrene which is basically abs so this if you don't know this is material that they use for plastic packaging for electro electronic housing like you know plugs in our homes auto parts you know seats belts seat packs lego toys pipe fittings things like this this is what you make from abs so it's a really common useful material uh, for for design purposes and these are the properties of of this and we'll be referring to these properties as we get into the modeling all right so two case studies to illustrate what we are doing and this is again the two case studies that they studied in the paper that we are working with so there's a y-axis compressive loading acting on the system uh, to create a universal compression in the y-axis and then there is a shear in plane yz you know in plane shear deformation so we'll look at that as well so that's what we want to do so let's just go ahead and start doing the modeling right away in abacus Okay, here we are in Abacus. So I'll create strut plus 45. The first strut is going to be 3D deformable and I'm going to extrude that using a solid um, shape. So what will be the dimensions? So the dimensions will be zero, zero and 10, 10. So this is the length of the strut that I'm working with. Click done, um, okay. So then I need to create the cross section, so which is a circle. So the center of the circle is 0, 0, and the diameter of the circle will be 0 0.250 0 for radius. So this is why our circle is going to be 0.5 millimeters. Okay, so that's fine. So this gives me the 45 degree oriented strut. Now we'll do the same thing. I call it strut, but minus 45 degree is still oriented. 3D deformable, swept, and that. So what do we do? So we create a 45 degree. So it will start from 10, 0 and to 0, 10. So we've got the 45 degree angle me measured. And then of course we need to sketch it, sketch the domain. So 0, 0, 0 0.250. 0. So this is fine. Now, so we've got both of them created there. So let's go to the assembly to start building it up into this lattice structure. So I'll select the two of them okay create instance in the assembly select the two of them click ok so we get this model so let's just view it so it's beginning to look like one of the axes that we are interested in so what i'm going to do is to form them into one domain so i'll select the two and match chords so i'll call this a lcs unit okay unit just one of it um, connect that select so this forms that so clearly we need to form another of that. So I'll, I'll select just only that. So basically now we have two unit cells of that. So what I need to do is the second one, I need to rotate it by 90 degrees to create the other orientation. So what we're going to do here is to use the rotate, rotate instance. So which instance are we looking to rotate? Obviously the second one. And what is the axis of rotation? So we need to rotate about this Y axis. Okay. But we need to do it centrally to the domain. So I'll select that point and that point so this is the central axis and then i want to do it by 90 degrees so now what this has done is that it's created now an, an a 90 degree orientation to the original strut so that when we look at it you could see we now have a body centered cubic structure if you want to work with other orientations you could do that but this is a simple case that we're working with in this in this demonstration so now we need to combine both of them to now form a unit cell Okay, so use match cut again. So I'm going to call this LCS BCC unit cell. We connect everything, so this is fine. So let's go back and double click on the path. So you could see we now have it in a path form and it's looking correct as we would want it to be. Okay, so what we then need to do, if you remember initially, I made this to be 10 meter long. So clearly we don't want it to be 10 millimeter long. So we want it to be about five millimeter. And this is because I want to allow myself the opportunity to be able to just extract the center here. And so for us to do this, there are a few things we need to do. So we need to put some kind of guidelines. Okay, so that's some planes. So the first one is on the X, Y plane. So the X, Y, X, Y, Z plane. So I want this to be about point, you know, um, 2.5. So let's turn it to the right at orientation. So you could see we've got it 2.5. So I'll click there again. And then on the other side will be minus 2.5. Okay, so we have, so if I turn off perspective, so we've got a structure that looks right here 
on this plane. So what about the other plane? So I've already done this, so you could work it out. So the offset will be 2.5, and then I click, so I'll go to the other side, you get 7.5. So we'll get, we've got all that in place. Now the last case will be again 2.5. I'll click the exit plane again, 2.5. 7.5 so if I turn it to the other axis so we've got all of them in their rightful place so that means this middle section is where we want our representative volume element that has a dimension of 5 by 5 a diagonal length of 7.07 .07 millimeters so we need to extrude cut and create that and so first what we need to do is to provide some partitioning so we use this partition plane to first do this so we click on this second option so you press and hold so the default is this, press and hold, and then you go to this option. Okay, the second option, which is called partition cell using the datum plane, which we've provided. So which cells are we looking to? All of that. Which datum plane do we want? So we can start with that. Create, so it creates the partition. So we select that again, create the other partition. And then we could run through and do everything for the other bits. So we go to the other side and create the same. So now here we are looking for this Y axis done. So we select that again, looking for this Y axis done. All right, so if we go and look at it, so you notice that you could see that it, it's cut through, provided all the cutting. So the final thing we need to do is to then extrude cut. So if I click extrude cut here, Okay, maybe first let me switch to surfaces. If I click extrude cut here, so it says here select a plane for your extrude cutting. And this is really where it becomes interesting. So I could select this plane because I want that plane to be the plane. Select the edge to use. So I'll select that basic edge. Okay, so now it gives me the window that I can provide my extrude cut. So I'll click the triangular option, rectangle option, zoom to this corner, make sure because you want it to be as accurate as possible. So get as close, so this is fine. Zoom out again, still, then go back to this point. Find the corresponding point on this other edge and select that. Okay, so that's done for the inside one. Then we'll click a triangle for the outside one. So then if we go back to the 3D view, so what you'll, you'll notice is going to happen is that the system is going to so if you go back, so you're going to slice through in that direction, through it all. Okay, so now you can see it's cut through. So we need to do the same on the other plane. So we'll do extrude cut again. So which plane do we want to use? Okay, maybe this will be the right plane so that we can extrude on the other axis. So again, we will do a similar thing of finding how close we are to the corner where we want to use. So we could start from here. So just make sure you get it right. Okay, so I'll zoom out again and then go to the point where I'm interested in having what I need. So this is this point. Okay, so that's fine. Now we'll make a, build a bigger triangle, cancel procedure. So we have the bigger rectangle, the smaller rectangle, leaving only that space inside. So we extrude cut all through now you have the structure that you are looking to get. Okay, so we've got our structure, so this is perfect. Now, if I go back to the path module, you know, everything is perfect. But the challenge when you're working with lattice structures is the meshing of this domain. It can be quite challenging to mesh this domain. And so to make easy our meshing job, we need to provide a lot of partitioning. So if I just, let's just try, try this. So let me demonstrate to you. So if you click on this, and say okay, whatever, and then you try and mesh this domain. It will identify regions where you can mesh because of the complex nature. And this is a real challenge with working with lattice structures. So we need to find a way to simplify this domain by providing opportunities for us to do a meshing. So an easier way to do this is just slice this up into as many little fragments as possible. The critical bits, so there are things that I could do straight away. So let's start with creating some um, datum planes. So we cl click on that on the XY plane. Remember on the XY plane, we started from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. So the center of that will be at zero. 
So I could show you. So we've got this at zero. This is fine. On the yz plane, we started from 2.5 to 7.5. So the center will be at 5. We could see that. And then the same thing applies. The center will be at 5. So we could see it on the other plane as well. So everything is fine. So that's the first thing we could do here. So let's, why not let's apply a partition. So remember, we are going to use the second option, which is partitioning using a datum. So select the cells. So we select all the cells, select that partitioning line, the middle one, done. Select the cells again. So we partition again, select all the cells again, done, and select the center line done so if let's just have a look and then we could turn to the other direction um, the same thing select all the cells done select the middle partition line okay so this is the wrong one so we'd select that so let's do that select everything select the datum plane which is this one okay so yeah so it's kind of worked out if you if you notice you will notice that this is divided in the middle, this is divided in the middle, and this is divided in the middle. So we've partitioned them to make it easier for us. But even then, it's still there's still a bit of a problem because in the center line here, this is quite a chunky bit and meshing is quite difficult around there. So we're going to still do something more. And this is why I said at the beginning, meshing of the domain is a critical part of trying to do this this problem trying to solve it so what we're going to do first is we're going to put some more partitioning option you know partition lines so I'm, I'm aiming to see if i can chop up this central region to make it easier for the algorithm to do the meshing so what i would need to do is i need to query so i click on query point so let's select this extreme point here i select the other one there okay so the two points that i want to use to partition click so it gives me what the length these points are so 4.646 and then 5.3 so i'll put um, a line so now it's on the x y plane so if we put a partitioning line so we would probably use this y option so this first point i'll select that and i'll put it in there and click enter so let's study and see it's not put it in the right way so let's try the second one so we'll put it here so you could see it's put it there the second one again so we'll take the second point right so basically we selected the second one and then we'll find that so this is the yz plane the um, xz plane so if we do the same on the other side okay so we could try the same so we'll put this so this is fine and then we'll put this on the other side still on the third plane so yes so what we have done here is that we've put this partitioning line to help us identify these regions that we want to chop up okay so the same thing i hear we found this on this region i want to chop up so what we need to do is to try the other side so again i'll query this point and try and find so you cancel so I'll query a point Okay, so we found all the edges, then use that to chop up the remaining model into, into C. So let's do this, click this, select all that, done. Okay, so we want to select the datum line, which is that. So we create a partition, we select all that again, select this other partition. So this is fine, Y, Z, X, Y. So we then we'll do the same to the other direction, which is the X, Y plane. So we select everything select that plane to create a partition select everything again select that point to create the partition all right so let's just study and see so we could see the central region has been nicely partitioned and chopped off in all directions so making it easier for the simulation to run 
I mean, the meshing algorithm to run. So let's just mesh this domain. So we double click on the mesh, select, okay, 0.15 is what is suggesting. This is fine. So we select the domain to apply um, a tetrahedral free meshing, and then we mesh. Then it should just give us the result. Okay, so we've meshed the domain and it's come out correct as we'll expect. So now at this stage, let me just hide some of these datum lines. So under the, so let's just within the meshing. So, okay, let's go back on the assembly module. So let's just hide the datum lines so that it doesn't get in the way. So show no datum line at all. So this is fine. And then we'll look at the mesh. So the mesh is fine. So we've got everything that we need in the mesh and we are kind of basically ready to, to go. So everything is fine in this domain. So we've meshed it and we could now run the simulation. So of course we need to create the material. So let's just go back and create the material. So our material will be ABS. So this, these are the properties of the ABS. So we're going to use that in our model. Okay. So now 0.8. 862 e to power 3 because we're working in units of millimeters so we convert the mega the gigapascal into basically newton per meter millimeter squared this is 0 0.35 the mechanical elasticity would be 33.33 and plastic strain of zero so that's what we have so we'll create a section so a b a section as usual so we have that and then we'll go to the model and do a section assignment so basically we select that domain done and create a section so the section is fine so again if i were on this module part display option i could just switch off all that soon okay so we have everything the way it is so we've got the mesh we've got the domain all created so let's now go and look at the step so we could do a static general loading step this is fine so a static general could still do this um, now the other things that we need to then do is to apply some kind of boundary condition okay but to make this boundary condition work easy for me so let me create some spaces some sets so still within the assembly module so double click on set so you can say y top set okay so basically i press down shift and select all this plane to present my y top okay so we've got that as in the top side and then we'll turn it around and then we'll get what you see on the bottom side okay so again we'll do the same so this will be y base uh, set so press down shift and pick up all of that okay so that's that now the other thing we need to do is okay so we restore it back to its original state so let's find maybe what this point could be so what would this point be in the middle here okay so it's basically 5 7.5 and 2.5 2.5 in the z-axis so let's create a reference point so two's reference point so let's use 7.5 7.5 instead of 2.5 why not let's do three so we get a point that's very close to this so we're going to apply our loading onto that point okay later on so why not let's create a set of that load so again within the assembly module so I call that reference point set so I clearly select that so this is fine now i'm going to then apply my load my boundary conditions so if i double click here so i'm going to say okay fixed base to only allow it you know um not even fixed base so roller base to allow it only to move in the y direction displacement now i'm going to because this is a compression case so y base set highlight this is what i want so I want it to be only resisting the system in the two direction, but then be free to expand in the other direction because this is what makes it unconstrained and hanging in the air. Now, the other thing that I need is obviously at the top end, I also need a boundary condition. So Y top roller as well. So we want the Y top to also be constrained. Okay, as much as we can, Y top constrained. So, but it's also constrained in the other direction. 
so that the system can go down, but then it can expand. So it can go down, but it should be able to also expand in the other direction. So that's what we have there. And then finally, we need to apply our load. So this will be my Y compression load. Okay, and then I'll change that to a loading step. So it will still be on the reference point. So I'm going to apply it on the reference point and it will be in the two direction. I will be maybe minus 1.5 will be acceptable. So basically the load is coming down and it's applied that. So I'll use my star constraint. So double click on star constraint equation. So let's call it constraint equation. So use the star equation option. So, and then one set will be Y top in direction two minus one reference point direction two. Okay, so we've connected that to that. Now, the good thing with doing that is that we can then extract the history output. So history, so I call it reference point history output. So now we could track what's happening to that reference point to find our reaction force in one, reaction force in Y, reaction force in Z, displacement one, displacement two, displacement three. So we want to use that. So the reaction forces will help us calculate the stress, displacement will help us calculate the strain. Okay, so we found that. So this is why it's important to work with a reference point like that. So we've got all that set up in place the way it should be. So let's just study the system. System is fine. Okay, so it's free, free to constrain and move down, free to expand in the base. The other thing that I want, because I also want the system to kind of behave in a nice you know, about the center line as you contract it. So what we could do is that we could decide to put a little bit of constraint in the middle, middle, just to allow the system to travel vertically, you know, because this is definitely a compression test. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to apply a constraint. So center, if you haven't seen this, I'll put a link to the video that I've made on compression, numerical insight on compression, so that you can see what is the wisdom for doing this. So clearly I want to just constrain this point. So I'll select that point press down shift, rotate the system while still holding down shift, select those two points. So basically I've got those two points and I want them to travel linearly down. Obviously they need to be free in the two direction, but constrained in the X and Y direction. So this is kind of what would make this system to follow um, a compressive behavior about the center. Then every other thing can be free to move around it. If you want, you could also, um, the white top ruler you could you could um you could decide to suppress it you know because with that you could the top will just move down and then the others could do whatever they want so this is how we're going to do this so we're going to run this so let me call this change it rename that model call it my y l c s y comp okay now we could submit that job to run so so to create the share case, so you create a copy. So I'm going to call this YZ share, YZ share. So I'll just use the same con component that I've, I've had before. So YZ share. So every other thing is the same. So what we need to do, obviously, we need to change the Y comp to YZ share. So YZ share would mean that we want to apply the load not in the two direction we want in the third direction and maybe 0.8 just about half that because the system is going to be quite rigid so let's reduce the stress level that we're applying so we want that and we don't want the media constraint so we suppress the media constraint the bottom y base roller base would have to be fully constrained in the x and y direction because it's now shared and then the top roller we obviously need to resume that so that the top roller will be there so so that it can constrain to move in the y direction so the top roller will find so it can move not in the so so basically yeah so we want it to be free to move in the z but the other direction is fixed okay and then the last thing to do is to check the constraint equation because we're now doing a shear deformation so y top is still but it's y z so this will be third exit and this will be the third axis, the Z axis. So we've got that. And then we could also submit the job and run. So we're going to then wait and see the simulation and what the result 
will look like. Okay, so this is a result of the Y compression. So you could see what's happening here. So if we speed this up a bit, so you could see how the system is compressing and moving down and going the, in the Y direction, in the Z direction. And because it's this fully unconstrained system, so the base is free to expand just as well as the top is free to expand as well. So this is kind of what you want to see with this kind of simulation. We could look at other, you know, maybe the shear deformation. So you could see this system is seeing a lot of shear deformation as it's twisting around. And this is kind of where all the impact loading comes in. So we, we get that response. So let's look at also the other case, the shear. Okay. So with a shear case, we get a similar response. So maybe if we exaggerate this a bit to maybe three or two. Okay. So what you notice as you run the simulation here is that the shear is sharing in that direction. Okay. So it's sharing in that, that direction. So we could see what's happening. So there's a shear deformation as it moves in the other plane. And this is also another beauty that you beautiful thing about this. So we could study the shear deformation in the one, two plane, one, three plane and two, three planes. So different kind of shared information. And you learn some things about this. So this is really how, what we're looking to do with this kind of simulation in terms of the lattice structure. So the challenge is always about building the structure and then you end up with this kind of results. So let's just put them together. Okay, so what we see here is basically the, the compressive behavior as well as the shear response. Okay, the compressive behavior as well as the shear response for, for this kind of system. And, 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 and yeah, so this is the exciting thing about this. So if we look at the shear deformation as well, so you could see what's happening in this case. So this gets compressed fully and then it gets into this flattened state and that shear continues. So beautiful things that we could be looking at. So this is a sense of the video that I wanted to make. I wanted to show you how these things work. And if this is the kind of content that you like, please do subscribe to this channel so that when content like this are made, you'll be the first to see it. So, uh, and if you have further ideas of things you would like me to do, please do suggest those and I'll look at them in future videos. Thank you very much for your interest in this and bye-bye.